How is it going, everybody? Nico here with the Wooden Spoon, delivering you guys yet another episode of the Sit Down. We have a very, very, very special episode today because we're talking about a controversial subject. We don't get political, but this time it's not really politics because it's culture. We're bringing up Columbus Day. Happy Columbus Day, everybody. Columbus Day, Columbus Day, Columbus Day. It's Columbus Day weekend. I'm in Columbus, Ohio right now. We're pre-recording the episode, but right now I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Um, this episode probably is being um, launched a day early. So if you're in Columbus, Ohio or nearby, definitely come stop, stop by the Italian Festival in Columbus. I'm there. We got spoons, hoodies, shirts, all the fun stuff. So come check us out here. But um, I'm not going to dive too much into the intro again because I have a great guest coming on. Um, it's John Viola. He's the co-host of the Italian American Podcast. Now, I love the Italian American Podcast. It's a great podcast if you really want to learn about Italy and Italian America um in itself they cover real the real issues we're here just bullshit we're having a good time we're having fun we're interviewing cool guests but um if you really want to dive deep into italian american culture history um learn about the language some of the different cities in america the different italian cities in america like i said history culture um you definitely want to check out the italian american podcast it's fantastic um, I've met John in person once, and he is an all-around great guy, somebody that I look up to um, in terms of bringing the culture forward and, and putting uh, Italian-Americans on the forefront and um, really just combining history with a um, little bit more of um, mo- modernizing uh, the culture, but um, still, still being in touch with our roots. So um, I guess without uh, further ado, let's, uh, let's bring John on here and let's get talking about Columbus. All right, guys, I'm very excited to bring on my guest. He's the co-host of the Italian American podcast and the executive director of the, um, say it again one more time. I'm sorry, John. At National Columbus Education Foundation. National Columbus Education Foundation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, John Viola. How's it going, John? It's good to be together. Really, really well. Thank you. I know we met a couple of years ago and it's like, like you said, whole, whole new world since then. Yeah, I know. I feel like you were in my office. Uh, it feels like a century ago, but it's uh, probably one of the last times I was in my own office. So, you know, oh, everybody's doing different things nowadays. Yeah, actually, it was probably February 2019, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I remember coming to visit and then like a month, like a couple of weeks after I was just locked up. <laughs> you know? Yep, I know. I, I, we built this beautiful facility with all of the soundproofing for the show and everybody was coming into Manhattan and uh all of a sudden we didn't use it anymore and zoom came out and we were doing all of our shows on zoom and i went the other day to pick up some t-shirts for san Gennaro and i realized much of our soundproofing had fallen off the walls so we can't oh use God. it right now anyway so yeah yeah well speaking of san Gennaro, how'd you enjoy the feast this year i thought it was great i mean it was great to be back in action i uh we at the italian american podcast got to do something really cool and sponsor a booth in the feast for the first time with uh E. Rossi and Company, the oldest yes. Italian American gift shop in the country. So we made exclusive T-shirts, which I'm I'm still wearing because I'm I'm working through my inventory of them here, and uh, we got to make and sell really cool shirts and interact with people and share information about the show. And then we had a float for the show in the parade last week, which was awesome, and uh, it was great. It just felt great to be back, and as always at these Italian events, to see the people that you know throughout the year and you interact with and then they get to hang out with them in person it's just a great great event great occasion for sure it was my first year this year at san Gennaro. oh what'd you think oh it was it was a it was a blast i didn't know it was it really was like he was huge in comparison to other italian festivals just all the way down mulberry scene all the different booths got to um meet some very cool people and yeah just it was a blast overall yeah and the san Gennaro festival is so big and so long over 10 days that if you like you kind of learn how to navigate it and when to go right because there's a lot of italians that are locals or former locals or families that have history in the neighborhood that come back for the mass and the procession or the great parade and Mm -hmm. uh, certain aspects of it and then certain points of the week it's really all kind of people from different backgrounds just looking for a good time so if you want to get the really italian version of it i guess it's sort of selectively choosing when to dip in yeah i I noticed because it got it got rowdy at some of the nights that we (laughs) yeah it always does yeah yeah it's new york 
I was gonna it. say it's New York. It's a festival. Everyone's having a good time. I didn't like nothing wrong about it. Everyone's just having. Everyone's just having a blast, which is good yeah. to see. That's not abnormal in New York. Yeah. So I guess since well, we're not recording on Columbus Day, but it's Columbus Day weekend. If people are listening, so you are the executive director of. I'm passing mine again, but um, the, the Education National of Columbus Columbus Education Foundation NCEF. NCEF. Okay. How did you get involved with the NCEF, I guess, to, to start? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, I spent six years as the president and chief operating officer of the National Italian American Foundation in Washington, NEF, another, uh, NEF or NIAF, another acronym for the resume. And um, one of the big initiatives that I always pushed while I was there was the idea that we needed more of the community's larger groups to work together more regularly, more frequently. And, uh, you know, historically, unfortunately, that's not been a strength of our community. So I, in my time there, built partnerships with a lot of smaller Italian American groups, but also the larger ones. And, and as I was on my way out, um, when I decided to step down from my position and come back to New York to get married, I spent a lot of time working with the Order Sons of Italy in America and the Italian Sons and Daughters of America, which is a significantly large group out of the Midwest and obviously up uh, in Buffalo by you, they got a big, yep. big presence. Mm -hmm. And ISDA is run by a man named Basil Russo, who I got to know very, very well and, and started working with pretty closely. And when I came back from DC, I decided to start getting active with ISDA. We opened some chapters there. So I've been working with Mr. Russo for many, many years now. He was elected to be the head of the Conference of Presidents of Major Italian American Organizations a few years back. And uh, he called me, one of our frequent catch ups, and he said, look, we're we're really at the point where we think we can gather the six largest groups in the country to start a new organization to coordinate our response to this Columbus issue. And I had worked on the Columbus issue, obviously, at, at NIAF. I had written about it a bunch. I'd been published around it. I'd done some conferences. So I was a known entity, I guess, within the community. And uh, this collection of six groups, the ISDA, the Sons and Daughters of Italy, uh, the National Italian American Foundation, UNICO, the Columbus Citizens Foundation, and a, a group called the Jambelli Foundation got together, raised a budget, and they were looking for an executive director. And they came to me and they mm -hmm. asked me if I would consider taking it on and, and helping them to found this organization. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I knew I couldn't give it full-time effort because of the podcast and everything we're doing with our video series and the app that we're building and stuff. So I, uh, I sort of got to a point where I, I agreed that if I could make it a part-time thing and eventually hire my own replacement, I would be, uh, I would be failing my community if I didn't do it. So that was the sort of agreement. Yeah. Because I feel like, like growing up, obviously, um, I was like, I remember just like a point in time where it's like you learned about Columbus and like preschool, kindergarten, grade school, middle school. Then there was like just like a transition where it's like, wait, we don't want to call it Columbus Day anymore. And it just like just I guess at the outside looking in at that point, it's like, well, what, what happened? And it's just like the rug got swept out from underneath. And then it's like, well, what, what's going on? And then it's like almost like collectively everyone just the entire nation just banned against Columbus. And it's just yeah. like, and then of course, because then you become the minority, like overnight, it's hard to speak out against these things or even find any resources. So what's like your take, like what exactly like happened during that time? I mean, like I've, I've spent a lot of my life researching this stuff now from the perspective of Columbus's true history from primary source material, all the way through a sort of specialization in his relation to America and Italian Americans. So from everything that I've been able to kind of gather, you know, if you look at the uh, celebrations in 1892 of the 400th anniversary of his landing, it was the biggest holiday the U S had ever seen. I mean, they spent years planning hundreds of monuments went up around the country, parades in every city, federal efforts, and if you look at the celebrations of the 500th anniversary in 1992, you start to see a little transition, you know, that they tone it down. Um, the Bush administration is aware that there's a lot of hesitancy in indigenous communities. So the celebrations get toned down a little bit from a federal level. And you start to see some uh, Native American activists 
gather around this idea of reassessing Columbus from a perspective of indigenous peoples. And really, I think it's safe to say a lot of the new narrative around Columbus comes from uh, People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Howard Zinn was a left-wing uh, academic who essentially set out, as he said, to, to create a disruptive bottom-up history of the U.S. as opposed to a top-down history. And uh, Columbus was the opening chapter for him and, and I guess his opening target. Um, it's been proven over time that a lot of Zinn's version of, of Columbus is based on misrepresentation of a very limited primary source material. And uh, unfortunately, it's also become one of the best selling books in US history and, and you know, used by academics and all levels. So it's eked its way into both academia, the younger uh, education, primary education, and now popular conversation. So I think Howard Zinn is at the root of this change in Columbus. And like you said, when, when you're on the minority side of a, of, a, of a populist argument, it's very hard to fight back. Yeah, because I even remember like in because I, I'm familiar with that book and they take primary resources that, of course, primary resources are from how many hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So it's hard, one, to even find resources Two, then you have to translate those from different yeah. languages. And I'm sure not everything was very legible or sure. And so you take things that were he said, like one thing, because I, I was doing I was doing research of my, of my own just a little bit. And they said something about they'd make great servants, servants, but it's very well because Columbus was a practicing Catholic that he could have meant servants of God. He could have yeah. converted them into um, Christianity. And, 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 you know, again, like when you look at the misappropriation of history, right, many scholars will translate. I don't know the, the Spanish word that he was writing in, but they will translate that to say slaves, first of all, which is not the case. Uh, secondly, yeah, servants could have multiple contextual meanings, particularly in 1492 uh, in the European mentality. A servant could be uh, a servant to God, right? A servant also is used throughout, like there's there's references in other letters that Columbus writes where he used the word servant to describe members of the court of the high chief of some of the Taino tribes. And so what he's saying is servants to the, the basically a monarch, right? A chieftain. Um, in the European model, a monarch. So uh, the idea of somebody being a servant, there's a there's a great case to be made that that really means subjects, you know, citizens. Be, before there was a term for citizens, it was subjects to to a monarchy. Everything was a monarchy. So, yeah, there's semantics at play here um, that it's just very very easy to pick and choose quotations and bend them to a, an agenda on both sides. For sure, for sure. I guess like the main issue that I mean I hear about because even growing up in the Niagara Falls, Buffalo area, there's a large um, native um, community there. So it's like at the forefront there, it's like, oh, he, he caused genocide and he traded slaves. And he basically they, they'll say everything to the extent of like raping and pillaging villages, yeah. which I mean, I don't, where do you think that idea comes from? Because I get that there's disease transfer, but I mean, we kind of saw it over the past two years, like one person comes from another country carrying an unknown disease and it it just flies through the entire it, well, COVID flew through the entire world so it's not yeah. and that, well, I mean, nobody purposely I mean we don't know but <laughs> I mean, the, of all the arguments around Columbus the genocide is, is to me the, the wackiest actually because genocide is a conscious effort on the part of one group to eliminate another group and Columbus is accused of genocide because he brings old world diseases to the new world. But what people don't really uh, either appreciate or those who know it and have an agenda don't, uh, don't tell you is we wouldn't understand that the germs existed for 200 plus more years. So, so you know, you're talking about people in the, 1492, the idea of a germ was completely foreign. They still talked about the, 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 uh, the, the fluids of the body and the, the, your your uh, temperatures and you know this, their idea of medicine was was really rudimentary compared to what we know now. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have understood germs existed, let alone that they could be utilized as a biological weapon. So it, there's no genocide without a conscious decision for there to be an effort to eliminate a people. And 
they had no idea they were bringing disease because they didn't really know disease existed. So that that whole genocide argument is, is really a nasty manipulation in my mind. Yeah. You know, yes, diseases did come both ways. You know, diseases came from the old world back to the new. We had different medicinal not to, not to reactions. I, I remember hearing something about it. Didn't it? Um... I forget there was like a sexually transmitted disease that came from the new world back to the old world. Um, yes, and I'm going to forget which one it is, but there is an STD. Uh, it's not syphilis because that that, that pre exists. I'm going to forget which one it is, but yeah, I'm, multiple diseases came from the new world back to the old. Um, you know, we also have very, very different. I mean, you know, we live in a world today where people don't want to prescribe any weight to uh, sort of race or ethnic differences, but the truth is, those of us that have roots in the old world have a, a different history around domesticity of animals, um, which means we've spent far more time in our human development around domesticated animals and their diseases. So we've built up natural immunities to them. The, there's very, very little, uh, the, there's far less experience of, dem of domestication of uh, a, a far less, far, smaller selection of animals in yep. the new world. So the immunity is very, very different. So, you know, you, you have to have a, a sophisticated approach. It's like uh, guns, germs, and steel, you know, people came from different conditions and the way we understood germs was far less than we do today. And the way we reacted to it was far different. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it was almost like no matter what, at some point, these diseases were going to come regardless of Columbus or not. And all of these things were going to happen just irregardless, like once two worlds yeah. basically were... No matter who interacted with who first, you know, there's a whole nother movement around like Leif Erikson and the uh, Scandinavian quote unquote discovery, which, you know, the critics don't want to use the word discovery because they say you can't discover something that's always been there. But then if they want to take credit away from Columbus, they say it was discovered by a Viking. But, uh, you know, if Leif, Leif Erikson's presence and the, the Scandinavian presence in the New World was so small and so contained, their interaction with indigenous people so limited. Uh, had they lasted any longer, I'm sure the diseases would have come through that transmittal. It's just, it was nothing we were going to do to stop that. For sure. Absolutely. And then uh, when they talk about like Columbus being a slave trader, now there was two, uh, two like major, um, I guess, uh, native like tribes, right? There was the the Taino, and then there was, um, what was the other one? So there's multiple tribes that get blocked into different groups, you know, the Taino, the Arawak. The two major tribal designations are Taino and Carib. And uh, Carib is where we take the word Caribbean from and also the word cannibal. Um, but they were very distinct cultures. You know, each island uh, had its own hierarchy. In, Many, many tribes within each island community had their own hierarchies. But uh, yes, Columbus came into a world where the first indigenous peoples he interacted with were either Taino or Carib. That's the, the majority groups. Yeah, but um, I, I, again, like these are just like off the top of my head, just things that I've seen. It's the mainly um, the slaves that he took in, which slavery was, he didn't invent slavery, which people keep saying he did. Slavery existed for thousands of years prior to Columbus. Yeah, yeah. But um, he took a lot of Carib slaves because they were like a cannibalistic tribe and not. Yeah, the the only the only instance that we really have of Columbus engaging in in enslavement is uh, an episode I believe on his second voyage, in which he takes prisoner, uh, some some say four hundred, some say seven hundred. Carib Indians. Uh, in Columbus's mind, look, the, the guy's not perfect, right? So he was a he was allied to the Taino tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, long before his arrival at war, on and off intermittent war, or at least struggle and facing invasion from the Caribs. The Caribs were uh, uh, practitioners of cannibalism. They had been, you know, taking children from the Taino tribes, fattening them up, uh, using them as as sacrifice and his food. Um, and in Columbus's context, you know, in his uh, sense of the world and of humanity was obviously a very Christian mindset, right? Mm -hmm. You have to remember Columbus finally gets approval for this journey in 1491, 92. That is 
uh, 40, 39 years after the fall of uh, Byzantium, of, of Constantinople mm -hmm. to uh, the Turkish Muslims. You're talking about a world where prior to that point, there was no sense of, you know, Columbus from Genoa, we say Italian, and there's the court in Spain. There was clear differences, but everybody felt they belonged to a, a sense of Christendom. And it was either Western Christendom, Latin Christianity in the in the West, or Eastern Christendom and Byzantine Christianity, Greek Orthodoxy now in the East. So Columbus comes from a world where you're either Christian or you're not. And 1453, the fall of Constantinople, signifies the end of 700 years of struggle between Christianity and Islam, at least around this most important city in, in, in the Christian world, because even then Rome, Rome was actually a backwater by that point. Um, so his worldview is one of Christ, Christians and non-Christians. And so he arrives on this island and uh, meets these indigenous peoples, recognizing that they are not Christian, that they could be offered in his mind, salvation through Christianity, because it's a very faith-filled world that he sets sail from. And uh, he believes then that these people, although they are not converted to Christianity, have souls. They are obviously humans. And, and, he, and he writes very, very kindly about the indigenous people that he interacts with, except for the Caribs, because in that era's Christian worldview, to engage in a sin like cannibalism means you can't have a soul. You can't be redeemed. You're, you're beyond redemption. So for him, it's really, frankly, not like dealing with the human in the same way. So it's not a, a racist thing. Like it's not like a, all these people because they are in this new world are are, are of a lesser mm -hmm. race than us. These Caribs are, in his mind, lesser humans because they engage in this sin of cannibalism. So when he goes into alliance to help protect his allies in the Taino tribes, they do take captive uh, four to seven hundred of these Caribs, and he does make an effort to send them back to Spain uh, so that they might be uh, utilized as slaves. And again, slavery existed all over Europe, all over the Middle East at this point. It was very common, increasingly less common in 1492 than it had been before, but still common that prisoners of war could be enslaved, um, not necessarily in the sense that we believe today of you know the, the concept of American slavery, of, of chattel ownership, but slavery and indentured servitude or in, as, as a punishment for a, a crimes in war. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does send them back, and the Spanish court rejects the idea that they can be made into slaves and, send, and, and, and frees them and, and send some of them back to the New World and others remain there. And unfortunately, yes, some of them do die in transit, and it's... Uh, it's, there's nothing pretty about this episode in his life, and it's a moment of, of weakness and sin on his part, but it's not this idea like, okay, I, I have this great concept called slavery, and uh, it, it, it directly leads to the original sin of the United States, which is the chattel enslavement of uh, African peoples, because mm -hmm. the two are completely unrelated. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess... Well, I mean, well, obviously you fast forward how many 400 years when Columbus Day was declared a holiday. Why did, um, why did do you think the U.S. government chose Columbus as like the forefront of like he should be the namesake of the holiday? Because it was in, um, I guess, like reparations for the lynching of the Italians in New Orleans, right? Well, that, that's a point that I always sort of diverge from our Paisani on because it's become and, 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 I, and I've, I've been active in this movement for you know, 10 plus years now. Um, it's sort of become our own popular reinterpretation of history to say Columbus Day became a holiday in response to this, the mass lynching in New Orleans. Uh, so let's give a little context first. And just cut me off of them babbling, but yeah. 1892, the 400th anniversary celebrations had been planned for a long time. Uh, Columbus Day was celebrated in 1792 before there were any significant Italians here. Columbus is a figure that has been many things to many people, both good and ill, throughout American history. Mm -hmm. Because in 1776 or 1783, when we finally throw off the shackles of British imperialism, uh, we have to build this new nation unlike anything else that's ever existed. And that's a nation of multiple peoples. You know, there's this obviously a, a 
British wasp majority, but there's already Germans here. There's already Swedes in New Jersey. There's Dutch in New York. There's indigenous peoples, right? We're building this multi-ethnic nation, which is really the first in of its kind. And we're building a nation based more on the idea of citizenship and, and rights and documents than on any sort of ethnic ties or national history. So we have to create national history and create uh, mythologies and, and, and systems and things like that. But because we just freed ourselves from Britain, which was the predominant source of history for these people and their identity, they were, you know, so many loyalists, they thought of themselves as British up until shortly before the revolution. Uh, they need a figure that is free from the taint of Britishism. And here's Columbus. He's, you know, he's anything but he's a, an Italian Catholic who uh, sailed for Catholic Spain, you know, is a totally free from anything British. So he becomes this proto founding father because it's a great symbol to gather around. Uh, obviously, you know, when uh, you're living here in New York now, if you go up to our Ivy League University here in the city, it's called Columbia University. Well, before that, it was King's College. And when you need to get rid of the royal symbol, who do you go to? We, we get go to Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when America was portrayed in you know popular media back then, before the creation of Uncle Sam up in Troy, New York, they used the figure Columbia. She was the female personification of the U.S. She, she is the statue that stands atop the Senate Dome. Uh, obviously, the District of Columbia, the capital. You know, there was a movement to name the nation Columbia instead of the United States. So she's he has always been a symbol. That, that the U.S. could rally around that was, was not British. Over the years, uh, obviously, our, our community sort of grows in number. And as this uh, celebration for the 400th anniversary is being planned in 1892, we are coming here in significant numbers. This is the peak of our immigration. And we are not a particularly well-loved group. We're mm -hmm. ethnically different, religiously different. You know, we don't fit any category. Uh, and in April of 1891, uh, 11 Sicilians are accused of murdering the police chief, Chief Hennessy, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Louisiana had a significant Sicilian population even before Italian uh, unification. So it's one of the oldest communities in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, these 11 Sicilians are exonerated. They, they're, they're, they're freed. The charges are dropped against them. They're, they're, they're found innocent. And uh, it so infuriates the populace of New Orleans that they break into the jail round these men up and lynch them uh, and murdered them uh, in, in what is the largest mass lynching in the history of the United States. And now that's, there are, there are some accounts that there's a larger number of Chinese Americans who were also lynched, but the, the, the term largest mass lynching comes from the idea that in the history of this horrible crime of, of lynch mobs, normally it was, you know, dozens of people, maybe a little bit more. Here was thousands of people in broad daylight in the middle of yeah. this, uh, one of the largest cities in the country uh, executing summarily 11 people who were just found innocent. So in reaction to that, you get a huge amount of tension between this young kingdom of Italy and the United States. Italy recalls its ambassador. There's talk of war. The U.S. offers uh, economic uh, uh, repayment uh, to Italy, and Italy says, you know, so this is not about money. This is about the rights of our citizens living in your country. Never before, at that point, Italy and the United States had never been so close to uh, you know, break in diplomatic relations and, and potentially even war. And there are some who say that President Harrison was inspired by this idea of reengaging this growing Italian community in the United States by sort of Italianizing some aspect of Columbus Day. But at the same time, we, we also suffered through the tragedy at Wounded Knee and the massacre of, of indigenous peoples. And Harrison is well aware that this 400th anniversary might be a good opportunity to reconcile with them and to engage them in this holiday. So the holiday is really even uh, in 1892, more about the multi-ethnic, multi-national background of this great United States, this mosaic, than it is about one group. It doesn't become sort of a de facto Italian holiday until much later. That's not to say that Italians are not inspired by Columbus. Like, you know, the Columbus statue in, in Columbus Circle, in New York, uh, we've always argued you can't take that down because it was built 
with nickels and dimes and 50 cents and dollars fundraised by thousands of Italians around the New York, New Jersey, tri-state area, the statue was already being planned to celebrate the 400th. It became a testimony to and a, and a, and a, a beloved icon of the Italian American community in the wake of this tragedy, when it inspired, when they were inspired to do more to show that they were good and functioning Americans, and Columbus was a great symbol for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, that definitely, that definitely, I think just that story alone could clear up a lot of um, clear up a lot of loose ends because it's one thing to just start yelling all these things that you hear from like obviously that's I guess modern day politics is just reading headlines and shouting them out but when you really dive in and even just listen to our what 20 30 minute conversation it really it's really um I think opens up a lot of eyeballs now um the no columbus k-n-o-w columbus.org there's tons of resources there and those are all like who who curated all those and what sources were are, um, some of those um documents from We've worked with a lot of different groups. So our inspiration behind No Columbus KNOW, which uh, it's safe to say publicly now, we also own NO Columbus, which should redirect to that site because we wanted to cut off our position at the at the feet. Um, it, it, because it's an alliance of six groups, six Italian American groups, we also wanted to really make the point that this is a, a national issue it's not just an italian american issue and why do you think italians just like kind of like what, what at one point where it feels like the only people defending columbus now are italian americans yeah yeah and i think that's because yeah i think in some ways our ties to the holiday really did hurt like you know columbus day columbus and columbus day have been used and abused by multiple sources right when we needed somebody who wasn't british we had columbus when the Know Nothing Party, the Nativist Party, was totally scandalized by the growth in uh, non-Protestant immigration, primarily Catholic and Jewish, Columbus became a symbol to tear down again. Uh, in the 30s, when there was issues with Italy and fascist Italy and this and that, uh, Columbus became a symbol for the fascists. That's when Italy started celebrating. At the same time, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant majority, particularly Scandinavians, that's when they started to go, uh, go anti-Columbus with the Leif Erikson uh, research. So it's, it's always been sort of used and abused, unfortunately, and never really examined objectively. Um, but I think as Italian Americans started to cling to the holiday itself and, 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 you know, you got the Italian internment during World War II, and then the reaction of the government to sort of make up for that and says focus on Columbus Day. And then in the 60s, you have this growing idea of ethnic identity politics and, and these, these power movements and black power and Puerto Rican power and Italian power. And Columbus Day sort of by default becomes ours. And it's really, even in the 60s, you still had huge parts of the celebrations around the country that were Hispanic Americans and indigenous Americans participating and, and other groups. And that starts to die away in the 70s and 80s. And so I think as our community was sort of told, hey, this is your holiday, enjoy it. The holiday became about much more than Columbus. The, the day itself, 1492, uh, October 12, 1492, becomes forgotten. The holiday was really founded to talk about th this date, not this man, mm -hmm. but his Italianness becomes the only thing we're really celebrating and, and other stuff added on. So you could talk as much about Columbus as you do about Mother Cabrini or Joe DiMaggio on that day. I think it really alienates other people who up until that point might have seen themselves in and their own social experience as an ethnic group in America in the Columbus story in the Colombian exchange and in the bridging of these two worlds and I think now uh, as Italian Americans have assimilated we are for the last 40 years plus the ones who are sort of celebrating on this day but we're celebrating our ethnicity less in general through the assimilation process so it's become less important and uh, even Many proud Italian Americans would argue, well, just call it Italian American Heritage Day. But unfortunately, that's not what any of the federal documents are about. And this doesn't say in the federal uh, legislation creating Columbus Day as a federal holiday to celebrate Italian Americans. It says to celebrate his accomplishment and the bridging of two worlds. So we kind of have a holiday and we don't. And in kind of having a holiday, we've alienated other groups who might actually care about Columbus and should actually care about Columbus. I was, yeah. Absolutely, because at the at the very end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is he's the one who's who bridged the two worlds. When there was like, it was like the last point. It was like he bridged the two worlds, and then people started to come over, and that's like kind of what sparked it. And correct me if I'm wrong. 
No, I mean, Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson says there's I don't remember the exact nature of the quote. He said something to the effect of, you know, there's no there's no more important moment in human history, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, you could argue the birth of Christ, I think, in, in my mind, probably yeah. more important as a practicing Catholic. But uh, certainly from a sort of secular perspective, I don't there is a, a, a more important secular moment because, you know. Think about if you went to a government today and said, hey, I want some money. I have this great idea that tells me if I shoot a rocket past the moon, I'm going to land on uh, you know, Mars, whatever. Uh, but I'm not really sure, but I really believe. And you don't land on Mars. You land on an undiscovered planet that we haven't seen yet. And on that planet is people or, or, or you know, some sentient species. That's basically what Columbus did. It was that far-fetched. You know? So how the hell would you react? You know, are you going to be there like, you know, checking yourself against sainthood? No, you're going to you're going to react. It's it's a totally unprecedented experience in the history of humanity. That's, that's and a great, great way that's to put what it. He did. Yeah. Absolutely great way to put it unprecedented. But I mean, I guess on that note, I think that should tie up a lot of loose ends for people. And um, I guess just Americans in general to celebrate Columbus Day, because like you said, it's not. I guess Italian American Heritage Month is all of October and Columbus Day is a bit, very big part of that. but like it's at the end of the day it's the merging of the new world and the old world and i guess just the very beginning of american history yeah it's it, you know it's our responsibility as a community I, I feel to not only seek truth in this thing and, and admit where columbus is flawed because he's very flawed he's a terrible administrator he's a total mess in terms of how he runs things that's true uh a lot of stuff is allowed to go on under his leadership as a colonial administrator when he's not there um but we have to accept that all humans are flawed and that this day while it's great to have a day to pound our chest and wave the red white and green it's really about more and so we're blessed and cursed by that responsibility and to me i'm on the record you know we did a seven-part series on this thing on, on the Columbus issue on our podcast, the Italian American podcast called Conversations with Columbus. And uh, I did 30 some odd interviews about this, with every expert that I could find pro or con. Some wouldn't speak to me. Um, and I spoke to Bill Connell from Seton Hall University, and he laughed at me when we started the interview because he said, you know, John, I quoted you in the Rutledge history of the Italian American experience at a conference that I did at NIAF where I said, my opinion was if a city was uncomfortable celebrating Columbus Day, instead of replacing it, instead of replacing it with Indigenous Peoples Day, let's just call it Italian American Heritage Day and have another day where we celebrate Indigenous Peoples. And in fact, we have four or five on the calendar right now in various uh, parts of the country. As I did this research in these 30 interviews, and I set out to do this now seven part series, it dawned on me that I still believe that as an Italian American, you know, I'd rather see a place give up Columbus Day and become Italian Heritage Day than Indigenous Peoples Day. Not that I don't think there's a deserved celebration for Indigenous Peoples, but we should stay on the calendar. As an American, I care more about this than I ever have, because as an American, to me, what Columbus represents is the most important things about this country. Risk, courage, belief in yourself belief in your own abilities, gambling on yourself. That's what every immigrant does when they come here now and has done since 1492. And, and when peoples butt up against each other, there's always ugly. You know, we, we face this on our border now. You know, we have a, a, an immigration crisis on our border. And there are people who are the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of immigrants who say, close that border off. That's ugly. You know, we, we still face the same tensions as human groups. And we always will. We see it in Europe with the immigration crisis there. Well, why can we, out of one side of our mouth, preach compassion to the ugliness and tension that happens around immigration today, but not compassion around the ugliness and tension that happened when two worlds met in this unprecedented moment? And I think the fact that I think it's a beautiful fact that still people risk everything they have to come into this country. They don't do that in other, you know, it may be, you know, they, they try to get into Europe and things like that, but this is still the only place you can have a dream and it's the American dream. It's no Chinese dream. There's no European dream. There's an American dream. And that is all the byproduct of Columbus. That's why it's an important holiday. Very, very, very well said. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's you know, like, I just very well said. 
And it's going to be a great sound clip on Instagram. On this oh, good. That's great. It's like I have more people yeah, tell me but, what an um, asshole I am for supporting Columbus. It's wonderful. No, like, I mean, I'm on the same boat as you, and this is me doing my part because I think there's a lot of people on, there's a lot of Italians out there, a lot of Italian pages that they don't even say happy Columbus Day when Columbus Day comes around because it's too controversial for them. Yeah. But I'm willing to say happy Columbus Day. And I yeah, think you know, that, that that's why we did the series. It's like, if you don't like that we're celebrating, you know, we get people who's like, how could you do this? So go, go listen to the seven hours of audio I, I, where I actually hopefully tried to take the audience through my exploration of why I should or shouldn't do it. You know, that's the best we can do. And if you don't have the patience to engage and seek truth, you may not like what I conclude at the end of it, but at least go through the process. Don't just take, you know, oh, my third grade history teacher told me Columbus was a bully. Yeah. If you do that, you're an idiot, you know, so do your research. And if you're an idiot and you don't do your research, I really don't care what you think. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I guess um, at the end, like where could everybody find uh, your socials? Of course, there's at the um, it's at Italian American for the Italian American podcast, Instagram page, the Italian yes. American podcast is on all platforms. I'm sure. Yeah. We're on everything. You can visit us on Italian American podcast.com. Um, you could find me on all different social platforms, although I don't really know what my handles are because I'm usually uh, not looking at them, but I'm certainly there. You can find me through the show. You can find the NCEF at nocolumbus.org. That's K-N-O-W or N-O. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're out there floating around and hopefully the audience that doesn't like we have to say, will at least take the time to listen to seven more hours about how I came to these conclusions. I mean, I'm excited to, to listen to them. I got to, I'm sure I'll listen to it on the car on the way to Columbus, Ohio. Cause we're going to be, we're going to be in Columbus, Ohio for um, Columbus day weekend at their Italian festival. That's really cool. That's yeah, exciting. It's a, it's a fun little thing. We'll go there, sell spoons, sell shirts. It's a Columbus is a great Italian festival. It's run. By I've never been St. John the Baptist. I think it's for, it's um, out of their church and it's a really, really great community. There's great people there. Oh, I'd love to do that. We've been traveling for our YouTube series and building lists of uh, where we're going to go. So I'm going to add, we were just in Cleveland, but we didn't film there. We did meetings there, but uh Ohio's great, got a great Italian community Absolutely. and it really always a pleasure to be. And I'm expecting my first daughter. My oh, wife congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So it might be on Columbus Day. So I'm going to be, uh, I get a year off this year, so I won't be in the parade. I won't be, I'll be on baby watch, but oh, I told my wife if she comes out on October 12th, we have to name her Columbiana. So we'll see. <laughs> Let's hope that's that doesn't awesome. happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome, John. And then everybody, there's all the links, I'm sure, wherever you're listening to this, um, for the Italian American podcast, for the Columbus, for anything Columbus related, uh, check the links. And thank you um, for taking the time out, John, to talk. Um, I was really oh, excited pleasure. to do this episode. Oh, my pleasure. I'm always happy to be together. And hopefully, now that you're in New York, we'll do it in person sometime. 100%. 100%. Absolutely. Awesome. And well, I'll talk to you soon. Everybody else listening, thank you for listening to this episode of The Sit Down. And we'll uh, catch you guys in the next episode. Ciao.